there's a big theme here because you come from the mecca of robotics, which is Carnegie Mellon University robotics. Like for all the people I've interacted with that come from there or just from, you know, the world experts at robotics, they don't, they would never build something like Cosmo. Yeah. And so where did that come from? So th the simplicity. This it came from this this combination of a team that we had, and it was it was quite cool because like we and by the way, you ask anybody that's like experienced in the like kind of you know toy entertainment space, you'll never sell a product over ninety nine dollars. Um, that was fundamentally false, and we believed it to be false. It was because the experience had to kind of you know meet the mark, mm -hmm. and so we pushed past that amount. But there was a pressure where the higher you go, the more seasonal you become, and the tougher it becomes. And so, on the cost side we very quickly partnered up with some previous contacts that we worked with where just as an example one our head of mechanical engineering um was one of the earliest heads of engineering at logitech and has a billion units of consumer products in circulation <laughs> that he's worked on yeah so like crazy low cost high volume consumer product experience we had a really great mechanical engineering team and just a very practical mindset where we were not going to compromise on feasibility in the market in order to chase something that would be enabler and we pushed a huge amount of expectations onto the software team where yes we're going to use cheap uh, noisy motors and sensors, but we're going to fix it in the um, on the software side. Then we found on the design and character side, there was a faction that was more from like a game design background that thought that it should be very games driven. Cosmo, where you create a whole bunch of games experiences and it's all about like game mechanics. And then there was um, a, a faction which my my co founder and I are most involved in this, like really believed in, which was character driven. And the argument is that you will never compete with what you can do virtually from a game standpoint. But you actually, on the character side, put this into your wheelhouse and put it more towards your advantage because a physical character has a massively higher impact uh, physically than virtually. This is okay. Can I just pause on that? Because yeah. this is so brilliant. When I, uh, for people who don't know, Cosmo plays games with you. But there's also a depth of character. And I actually, when I was, you know, uh, playing with it, I wondered exactly what is the compelling aspect of this. Because to me, obviously, I'm, I'm biased, but to me, the character, yeah. I get what I enjoyed most, honestly, or what got me to return to it is the character. That's right. But that's, that's a fascinating discussion of, uh, you're right, ultimately, you cannot compete on the quality of the gaming experience. It's too restrictive. The physical world is just too restrictive. Yeah. And uh, you don't have a graphics engine, it's like all this. But on the character side, we, uh, and clearly we moved in that direction as like kind of the the the, the winning path. And um, we partnered up with this uh, really, we immediately like went towards Pixar. And Carlos Bena, he was um, one of, like had been at Pixar for nine years. He'd worked on tons of the movies, including WALL-E and others. And, just immediately kind of spoke the language and it just clicked on how you think about that like kind of magic and drive. And then he, we built out a team, uh, you know, with him as like a really kind of prominent kind of driver of this with different types of backgrounds and animators and character developers where um, we put these constraints on the team, but then got them to really try to create magic despite that. And we converged on this system that was at the overlap of character and the character AI that where if you imagine the dimensionality of emotions, happy, sad, angry, surprised, confused, uh, um, scared, like you think of these extreme emotions, um, uh, we almost like kind of put this challenge to kind of populate this library of responses on how do you show the extreme uh, response that like goes to the extreme spectrum on angry or mm -hmm. frustrated or whatever. And, and so that gave us a lot of intuition and learnings. And um, and then we started parameterizing them where it wasn't just a fixed recording, but they were parameterized and had randomness to them where you could have infinite permutations of happy and surprised and so forth. Um, and then we had a behavioral engine that took the context from the real world and would interpret it and then create kind of probability mappings on what sort of responses you would have that actually made sense. And so if Cosmo saw you for the first time in a day, um, he'd be really surprised and happy in the same way that the first time you walk in and like you're toddler sees you they're so happy but they're not going to be that happy for the entirety of your yeah. next two hours but like you have this like spike in response or if you leave him alone for too long he gets bored and starts causing trouble and like nudging things off the table yeah. um or if you beat him in a game um the most enjoyable emotions are him getting frustrated and grumpy yeah. to a point where our, our testers and our customers would be like i had to let him win because i don't want him to be upset yeah. and uh 
And so you, you <laughs> start awesome. to like create this feedback loop where you see how powerful those emotions are. And just to give you an example, something as simple as eye contact, um, you don't think about it in a movie, just like it kind of happens like, you know, camera angles and so forth. Um, but that's not really a prominent source of interaction. What happens when a physical character like Cosmo, when he makes eye contact with you, um, it built universal kind of connection, kids all the way through adults. Um, and it was truly universal. It was not like people stopped caring after 10, 12 years old. Um, and so uh, we started doing experiments and we found something as simple as increasing the amount of eye contact, mm -hmm. like the amount of times in a minute that he'll look over for your approval to like kind of make eye contact. Just by, I think, doubling it, we increased the play time engagement by 40%. Right. Like you see these sort of like kind of interactions where you build that empathy. And, and so we studied pets, we studied um, virtual characters. There's like uh, a lot of times actually dogs are uh, one of the perfect, the most perfect uh, um, influencers behind these sort of interactions. And what we realized is that the games were not there to entertain you. The games were to create context to bring out the character. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the types of games that you know that you played, they were relatively simple, but they were always ones to create scenarios of either tension or winning or losing or surprise or whatever the case might be. And they were purely there to just like create context to where an emotion could feel intelligent and not random. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, it was all about the character. Um, so the, yeah, there's so many elements to play with here. So you said dogs. What lessons do we draw from cats who don't seem to give a damn about you? <laughs> is that just another character? Is it uh, another? It, is, it's, is, it's just another character. And so you you could almost like in the early explorations, we thought that it would be really incredible if you had a diversity of characters where you almost help encourage which direction it goes, just like in a role playing game. Mm -hmm. um, and you had uh, like think of like the you know seven dwarves sort of. And uh, um, and initially we even thought that it would be amazing if like you know they're like. You know, like their characters actually help them be have strengths and weaknesses, and some you know, like whatever they end up doing. Like some are scared, some are you know uh, arrogant, some are uh, you know super warm and like uh, kind of friendly. And in the end, we focused on one because it made it very clear that we, hey, we got to build out enough depth here because you're yeah. kind of trying to expand. It's almost like how long can you maintain a fiction that this character is alive mm -hmm. um, to where the person's explorations don't hit a boundary, um, which happens almost immediately with with typical toys mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know even with video games. Uh, how long can we create that immersive experience to where you expand the boundary? And one of the things we realized is that you're um, just way more forgiving when something uh, has a personality and it's physical. Um, that is the key uh, that unlocks... Uh, robotics interacting you know in the physical world more generally is that that uh the when you have a when you don't have a personality and you make a mistake as a robot the stupid robot make it made a mistake why is it not perfect when you have a character and you make a mistake you have empathy and it becomes endearing and you're way more forgiving and that was the key that was like i think goes far far beyond entertainment